<clears throat> Welcome to slide set one. In this particular slide set, we are going to talk about water soluble vitamins. So, first, we will classify the vitamins, then, we will review the different water soluble vitamins, and as part of that review, we will look at the source of these vitamins talk about the metabolism of some of the important water soluble vitamins, relate to the function of these vitamins and try to understand their clinical importance. So if I have to classify vitamins, I will classify them broadly in two classes. One that are soluble in fat and known as fat soluble vitamins. And in this particular group, we have vitamins A, D, E, and K. And this particular vitamins we will deal in slide set 2. However, in this particular slide, as you can see here, the key function of the fat soluble vitamins are summarized. The second broad class of vitamins are the water soluble vitamins. And we can further classify them into vitamins that are involved in energy metabolism, among which we have B1, B2, B3, biotin, and pantothenic acid. Water soluble vitamins that are involved in metabolism of amino acids. And here we will talk about vitamin B6 in detail. Then we have water soluble vitamins that are involved in RBC and neural development where we will focus on folic acid and cobalamin or vitamin B12 and of course we have ascorbic acid and vitamin C as the one of the other classes of water soluble vitamins which is involved in collagen synthesis. So let us start with vitamin B1 which is also known as thiamine. The most important source of thiamine are whole grains, especially unpolished rice. And the active form of vitamin B1 is thiamine pyrophosphate. And if you remember your lectures from biochemistry, thiamine pyrophosphate acts as a cofactor for pyruvate dehydrogenase which is responsible for the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A and acetyl coenzyme A feeds into the TCA cycle and the other important enzyme where TPP acts as the cofactor is transketolase which is involved in the pentose phosphate pathway. Now deficiency of thiamine generally occurs in alcoholics because in case of alcoholics, the gastric mucosa is damaged as a result of which there is decreased absorption of thiamine and therefore alcoholics suffer from thiamine deficiency which is manifested in the form of a particular, uh, particular disorder known as WKS or wernick koraskoff syndrome which has severe, uh, where there is uh, severe uh, neurological impairment. Now, in the exam, often it is asked which are the enzymes that require thiamine for their, uh, thiamine as a cofactor for their activity. And one of the easy mnemonic to remember these three enzymes is ATP, A for alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, an enzyme that participates in the TCA cycle, transketolase as I mentioned previously, an enzyme in the pentose phosphate pathway and we have pyruvate dehydrogenase complex which is an enzyme responsible for converting pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A. And if you remember the lectures from biochemistry, you know that the mechanism of action of alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex are more or less similar except that the substrate and products are different. <coughs> now, 
Now, apart from people who are suffering from, uh, apart from alcoholics, you will also observe vitamin B1 to be deficient in people who have undergone metabolic surgery and this particular condition is known as bariatric warnick and also because B1 is a water soluble vitamin due to chronic diuretic therapy there is increased excretion of vitamin B1 which leads to its deficiency. Further, there is maternal thiamine deficiency which leads to deficiency of the particular vitamin in breastfed infants and this particular condition is known as infantile beriberi. Now there are other forms of beriberi, broadly they are classified into two classes, wet beriberi and dry beriberi. Just for information, wet beriberi affects the cardiovascular system whereas dry beriberi is mostly affecting the nervous system. The next water soluble vitamin is vitamin B2 or riboflavin and the major source of vitamin B2 is milk. However, you need to remember that vitamin B2 is photosensitive so if milk is exposed for prolonged periods to light there is degradation of this particular vitamin. Now riboflavin is converted to flavin adenine dinucleotide and flavin mononucleotides which are called the active forms of the vitamin and if you remember from your lectures in biochemistry FAD is a cofactor associated with the succinate dehydrogenase complex which is involved in conversion of succinate to fumarate in the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle. Flavin mononucleotide of course is an important component of the electron transport chain which is responsible for oxidative phosphorylation. Riboflavin deficiency is usually seen in severely malnourished individuals and also in pure vegans because they are not taking any kind of dairy products and as I mentioned before milk is the rich uh, milk is one of the richest sources of riboflavin. So if there is lack of intake of meat or dairy products, the person suffers from vitamin B2 deficiency. We move on to the next water soluble vitamin which is known as niacin vitamin B3 or nicotinic acid. Niacin, the richest source of niacin is, meal, uh, is meat. Sorry and also niacin can be derived from whole grains and food sources that are rich in tryptophan. In fact, if you look at the metabolism of niacin, excess amino acid tryptophan is metabolized to niacin and this actually supplies 10% of the recommended daily allowance of niacin. There are two active forms of niacin, NAD+, which is primarily involved in catabolic reactions, for example, glycolysis, if you remember from your biochemistry lecture. And NADP+, which is primarily involved in anabolic uh, reactions, for example, fatty acid synthesis. Clinically, niacin or nicotinic acid is a lipid lowering agent. However, it is prescribed mostly because it has an ability to increase the levels of high density lipoprotein. As high density lipoprotein is responsible for the clearance of cholesterol because it carries cholesterol from the peripheral tissues to the liver and is involved in reverse cholesterol transport. Therefore, increasing its level lowers cholesterol in the physiological environment and I believe you have studied this when you studied lipoprotein metabolism. If you haven't studied lipoprotein metabolism, you can quickly refresh these concepts through the lectures on biochemistry which are available on the YouTube channel where these lectures are also uploaded. So this is a particular study that I wanted to show to you where it, it is shown that 
increasing the doses with increasing doses of different forms of niacin there is elevation in the levels of HDL. So in this particular study they use two forms of niacin immediate release niacin called IR and sustained release niacin. So you can see here with immediate release niacin there is rapid elevation of HDL with increasing doses whereas with sustained release niacin although there is increase it takes some time. The problem with immediate release niacin is that it causes flushing because niacin binds to G protein receptors and increases the levels of prostaglandins in the physiological environment. The deficiency of niacin leads to a condition known as pellagra and this deficiency can be because of limited dietary intake of niacin. However, it can also be associated with diseases where there is decrease, uh, decrease in availability, bioavailability of tryptophan because it is excreted out in the urine and stool, a condition known as heart nubs disease which is a genetic condition or if Tryptophan is excessively used, for example, in carcinoid syndrome. So, the early symptoms of pellagra in general involves loss of appetite, abdominal pain and vomiting. But most telltale sign of pellagra is the presence of bright red glossitis, which is found in the skin and you will see this in the form of a rash that is pigmented particularly in the skin areas exposed to sunlight as you can see here in this particular part of the slide and this particular uh, signature which is known as Casals necklace tells you that the person is suffering from advanced stages of pellagra and if not if there is if dietary supplementation of niacin is not introduced, there can be detrimental consequences. Primarily, manifestations of pellagra can be uh, summarized into four Ds. First, there is dermatitis, where you will see Casals necklace. Then there is diarrhea. Then dementia, that is loss of memory and other neurological functions and ultimately death. As I mentioned, if there is an imbalance in the use of tryptophan, it also may lead to pellagra because tryptophan is the precursor for the formation of niacin. So the first condition we call the heart knobs disease. It's an autosomal recessive disease where there is a defect in the intestinal and renal reabsorption of neutral amino acids. And one of the neutral amino acids, if you remember, from your amino acid lecture is tryptophan. Heart nerve disease is associated with photodermatitis and you can see here and in this particular part of the figure and cerebellar ataxia. The way heart nerve disease is diagnosed is to examine the urine of the patient who is suspected with the disorder to look for neutral amino acids. In carcinoid syndrome, there is increased conversion of tryptophan to serotonin and this produces flushing as you can see here in a patient who is suffering from the carcinoid syndrome. And also because of the increased production of serotonin, people with carcinoid syndrome suffer from diarrhea. And this syndrome is because of a carcinoid tumor in the small intestine that often metastasizes into the liver. Now metastatic nodules secrete serotonin into the hepatic vein tributaries which actually is responsible for the syndrome. 
The next water soluble vitamin is pantothenic acid which is present in a variety of foods. It is a common uh, common ever uh, it is it is present in so um, uh, pantothenic acid is present in most of the food that we take regularly so the deficiency of pantothenic acid is quite uncommon. Pantothenic acid is an important component of coenzyme A and the, as you can if you remember from your biochemistry lecture that this particular coenzyme A is part of the fatty acid synthase complex so pantothenic acid is involved in fatty acid synthesis. We move on to pyridoxine or vitamin B6 which is one of the important <coughs> water soluble vitamins present in whole grains uh, mostly eggs, meats, fish and nuts and you need to know that pyridoxal phosphate is the active form of the vitamin. Now pyridoxal phosphate which is the active form of the vitamin is involved in amino acid metabolism. If you remember we took these particular enzymes we, when we talked about transamination in the metabolism of amino acids in biochemistry. It is also a cofactor for a particular enzyme that is involved in hem synthesis and deficiency of pyridoxine therefore leads to a specific form of anemia known as sideroblastic anemia. Pyridoxin is involved in the synthesis of neurotransmitters such as gamma amino butyric acid, serotonin and norepinephrine. There is a particular lecture on specialized products from amino acids where I have extensively talked about the role of pyridoxin in the synthesis of neurotransmitters. If you want to have a browse through this particular lecture you can have a browse through. Pyridoxin also acts as a cofactor for the following reactions. Decarboxylation which is seen in the conversion of histidine to histamine. Glycogenolysis if you remember glycogen phosphorylase uses pyridoxal phosphate as one of the cofactors. Deamination reactions such as the conversion of serine to pyruvate and ammonia. And other important fact is that it acts as a cofactor for the conversion of neutral amino acid tryptophan to niacin. You need to remember that there are certain drugs that bind to the carbonyl group of pyridoxal phosphate and therefore deplete the particular enzyme in the physiological milieu. And one of these drugs is isoniazid which is commonly used for the treatment of tu uh, tuberculosis. So this drug binds to the carboxyl group of pyridoxal phosphate which is derived from vitamin B6 and because of deficiency of pyridoxal phosphate there is peripheral neuropathy. Therefore, it is recommended that whenever this particular medication is used by a particular patient, the patient should also take vitamin B6 as supplement in the diet or in the form of tablets or capsules. We move on to cobalamin which is a cobalt containing water soluble vitamin mostly present in meats, shellfish, poultry, eggs and dairy products. Again pure vegans lack vitamin B12 because they are not taking any dairy products and therefore pure vegans who are pregnant or who are breastfeeding require vitamin B12 supplements to prevent anemia from developing in the infant. As you can see here in this particular part of the figure, cobalamin removes a methyl group from N-methyl 
tetrahydrofolate to form tetrahydrofolate and this tetrahydrofolate is used to synthesize DTMP from DUMP which is required for DNA synthesis. Also if you look at this particular part of the reaction as cobalamin gets converted to methyl cobalamin and back to cobalamin there is a conversion of homocysteine to methionine. Now methionine if you remember from our amino acid lecture is the precursor for cysteine residues but most importantly if this particular conversion of homocysteine to methionine doesn't occur there is a buildup of homocysteine in the body. Therefore deficiency of cobalamin leads to homocysteine buildup and homocysteine has been shown to be atherogenic in nature. So what does homocysteine do? It actually injures the arterial wall and initiates a cascade of reactions that you have learned in atherosclerosis and increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, nowadays homocysteine is often used as a marker for the detection of cardiovascular disease. Further, cobalamin has an important neurological function. If you remember, we talked about fatty acid metabolism where we talked about odd chain fatty acid metabolism. In odd chain fatty acid metabolism, to just quickly revise, propionyl coenzyme A is the end product which is converted to methyl manolyl coenzyme A. Now cobalamin is an important cofactor for methyl manolin coenzyme A mutase which converts methyl manolin coenzyme A into succinyl coenzyme A. Therefore, odd chain fatty acid metabolite can go into the citric acid cycle for the generation of ATP. So if there is a deficiency of cobalamin or vitamin B12, there is an increase in methyl manolin coenzyme A which is converted to methyl malonic acid and this methyl malonic acid creates a proximal enzyme block which increases the concentration of propionyl coenzyme A and this leads to demyelination of spinal cord. predominantly and to some extent to the peripheral nerves and the brain. So if I look at it as a collective, there will be subacute combined degeneration, peripheral neuropathy and dementia. So cobalamin deficiency leads to neurological impairment or neurological insufficiency. And this is the particular mechanism. This mechanism is important because often it is asked in the assessment. The other thing that I wanted to mention because <clears throat> this has been a focus of interest especially in biochemical research currently that vitamin B12 complexes with R factor in the saliva. R factor complex prevents degradation of vitamin B12 by the stomach acid. Now there is another factor called intrinsic factor that is synthesized in the parietal cells located in the fundus of the stomach and in pernicious anemia where the parietal cells are destroyed there is a deficiency of intrinsic factor that leads to vitamin B12 deficiency and I will just tell you how this deficiency occurs. So what happens is that the pancreatic enzymes, they cleave off the R factor which allows vitamin B12 to bind to the intrinsic factor in the duodenum. So once the R factor B12 complex passes from the stomach into the duodenum, 
the pancreatic enzymes will cleave off the R factor such that the B12 can bind to the intrinsic factor. So if the person is suffering from chronic pancreatitis where there is insufficiency of pancreatic enzymes, there is malabsorption of vitamin B12. Similarly, bacterial overgrowth destroys the B12 IUF complex and this may also lead to deficiency of vitamin B12. <coughs> Further, fish tapeworm <coughs> uses vitamin B12 in its metabolism. So, if a person is infected with fish tapeworm, he or she may also exhibit functions related to vitamin B12 insufficiency. The vitamin B12 IF complex binds to IF receptors in the terminal ileum and is absorbed. So if there are term, if a person is suffer, suffering from terminal ileal disease such as Corns disease, there will be insufficiency of vitamin B12 functionality. Now once vitamin B12 is absorbed, it is converted to transcobalamin 2 in the plasma delivered, meta, uh, delivered to metabolically active cells which require cobalamin for their function or they are stored in the liver and the liver can store up to 6 to 9 years of supply of cobalamin. So as Vitamin B12 is one of the important water soluble vitamins. I thought of summarizing the causes of deficiency for this particular water soluble vitamin. So people who are on pure vegan diet, they will suffer from vitamin B12 deficiency because they are not taking any milk or dairy products. People suffering from pernicious anemia because there is destruction of parietal cells. There is no intrinsic factors that is being synthesized. As a result, they will suffer from vitamin B12 deficiency. Similarly, people who are suffering from chronic pancreatitis will also suffer from vitamin B12 deficiency because pancreatic enzymes are not there or they are impaired in sec uh, the secretion of these enzymes are impaired such that the R factor is not cleaved off and therefore absorption of vitamin B12 doesn't happen. Then bacterial overgrowth where the B12 IF complex is destroyed also, people who are suffering from fish tapeworm infection can also have deficiency of vitamin B as this particular parasite uses vitamin B12 for its metabolism. As the absorption of vitamin B12 takes place in the terminal ileum, therefore people who are suffering from terminal ileal disease such as Corns disease can also have insufficiency of vitamin B12 function. We move on to another water soluble vitamin called folic acid, often called folate. So folic acid, the rich source of folic acid are green leafy vegetables and liver. However, they are also present in legumes, whole grain cereals and yeast. Now what is the function of folate? It is one of the important components of tetrahydro, uh, tetrahydrofolate. We talked about this molecule when we talked about cobalamin. And tetrahydrofolate receives a methylene group to produce NN methylene tetrahydrofolate. So, this is the particular molecule where it receives a methylene group from serine. As you can see here, serine gets converted to glycine. This methylene group is transferred to DUMP to produce DTMP. And therefore, this is an important step required for
for the synthesis of DNA. The enzyme that catalyzes this particular reaction is thymidylate synthase. So one can say that folic acid deficiency impairs DNA replication due to shortage of purine nucleotides and thiamine. And I believe they would have talked about this particular process when they talked about nucleotide metabolism in the course of molecular biology. So you can just quickly revise those particular notes which will help you to understand this process better. Drugs such as fluorouracil, a chemotherapeutic drug, binds to thymidylate synthase and irreversibly blocks this process and since DNA synthesis is completely impaired in the presence of the drug, cancer cells are not able to replicate and their growth stops. But you need to also remember that apart from cancer cells, this particular drug will also affect the DNA synthesis in normal cells as well. Now, two hydrogens from tetrahydrofolate. are used in the formation of DTMP resulting in the formation of dihydrofolate as you can see here and this particular reaction is con uh, catalyzed by dihydrofolate reductase. <coughs> now methotrexate which is also a chemotherapeutic drug used for the uh, treatment of cancer and trimethorprim which is an antibiotic inhibit this particular enzyme dihydrofolate reductase and because the DNA synthetic machinery is getting impaired replication of cancer cells especially for methotrexate is attenuated but you need to also remember that apart from cancer cells the same drug will also have detrimental effects on normal cells. Folic acid is ingested in polyglutamate form. Now polyglutamates are converted to monoglutamates in the jejunum by intestinal conjugase. So if any drug binds to intestinal conjugase, it will detrimentally affect folic acid metabolism. Folate monoglutamate is absorbed in the jejunum. And most importantly, you should remember that folate, folate monoglutamate absorption is blocked by alcohol and oral contraceptives, which leads to folic acid deficiency. Therefore, if a lady is on oral contraceptives, one should carefully monitor their folic acid levels because it can have detrimental consequences. We come to another water soluble vitamin, biotin. If you remember, we talked about this particular um, vitamin which acts as a cofactor for carboxylase reactions, especially pyruvate carboxylase or acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase or propionyl coenzyme A carboxylase. Now pyruvate carboxylase, we talked about this particular enzyme and biotin when we talked about gluconeogenesis. Now biotin deficiency is mostly caused if a person takes raw eggs because this contains avidin which binds to protein, uh, binds to biotin and Therefore, it is recommended that a person should not take raw eggs. Since avidin is a protein, if it is heated up, it is denatured and therefore the binding of avidin to biotin doesn't take place. Also, biotin is synthesized by our intestinal flora. So, if a person is on broad spectrum antibiotics, the synthesis of biotin inside the body is attenuated. 
We come to vitamin C, which is a water soluble vitamin. I believe you all know that vitamin C is present in large quantities in citrus fruits such as lemons, oranges. Now, the important function of vitamin C is hydroxylation of lysine to proline residues during collagen synthesis. We talked about this when we talked about amino acids in biochemistry. It is on a, also an antioxidant and inactivates hydroxy radicals, reduces non-heme iron from plants to ferrous state for absorption in the duodenum, keeps tetrahydrofolate in its reduced form, cofactor in the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine in catecholamine synthesis. It is also an important cofactor which I have not mentioned in synthesis of bile salts which you already know probably when you have taken the enterohepatic circulation of bile. Lack of vitamin C leads to a condition called scurvy where there is where a person observes bleeding gums and this particular disease often is more common in smokers especially because they suffer from a deficiency of vitamin C because the vitamin or increased levels of ascorbic acid or vitamin C is required to reduce or neutralize the free radicals that are produced from cigarette smoke. Now most of the water soluble vitamins which we talked about do not lead or do not lead to hypervitaminosis if they are taken in increased concentrations except for ascorbic acid or vitamin C where excess amounts of vitamin C can lead to renal calculi. Often it is asked why in smokers or why smokers suffer from bleeding gums and the answer to that is because of the deficiency of vitamin C as increased levels of vitamin C are required to neutralize the free radicals in smokers and these free radicals are present in the cigarette smoke. This is a cheat sheet for the symptoms and sign of deficiency for the different water soluble vitamins. I am not going to read through it but and neither I am going to ask you to memorize this but it kind of summarizes the different chemical uh, different sorry different pathological conditions which you may observe if a particular water soluble vitamin is deficient. When we go to slide set 2 uh, you will see that there is an another column which is related to hypervitaminosis. In case of water soluble vitamins as I said because they can be easily excreted out in urine, one does not observe hypervitaminos hypervitaminosis except in case of vitamin C where excess amounts may lead to the formation of calculi. So that is the end of slide set 1. In slide set 2 we will talk about fat soluble vitamins. So keep listening and try to may take notes especially the one aspects of metabolism which you might want to revise. Please go back and listen to the other videos on the YouTube channel if you need to revise some of the older concepts of biochemistry. Thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day.